Senakota Kato, welcome. Uh, I'm Pauline from Mobile Health, and it's my pleasure today to introduce your presenter, David Garland. David is a nurse practitioner in ophthalmology, and he's worked in that field, including theatre and clinics. He works in a variety of settings in ophthalmology, including medical, retina, cornea, uveitis, and glaucoma. And he's working towards establishing a diabetic retinopathy clinic in collaboration with the Diabetes Service. He's now based at both Green Lane and Waitakere Hospital Eye Clinics with an interest in retinal and inflammatory eye disease. Welcome, David. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks, Pauline. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been, uh, as Pauline said, I've been um, in ophthalmology for about um, 17 years um, in both theatre and uh, in the clinic environment now. Um, and became a nurse practitioner about uh, three years ago. Um, so today's talk is just really about um, common eye problems that uh, we tend to see quite a lot in the um, eye clinic um, and um, talk about sort of the management um, and um, the sort of diagnosis around this. And we'll also be looking at um, sort of the red flag conditions that um, we tend to worry about um, and just hopefully that uh, might, uh, if you see these sort of patients in the community, it might just jog your uh, memory to, to maybe think that, to push these patients uh, forward a little bit quicker. Um, so just um, generally, the, the eye, we always like to say is, is like a camera, or actually the camera is like the eye really, because uh, um, the, the camera is based on the eye, but very, very similar uh, principles to both of them. So they both have a, what they call an aperture, which is in the eyes of pupil, um, there's a diaphragm which allows more or less light in, um, which of course is the iris in the eye. Um, there's a lens which helps with focusing. And the film is the, is the retina at the back of the eye that takes the pictures. Um, and um, the uh, choroid is kind of uh, the underlying uh, uh, vascular structure that gives um, the, um, basically the, the reflex off the back of the eye. So when we're looking at the back of the eye and you see a red light, that's actually the, the choroid, the vascular structure that, that you're seeing there. Um, so the eye is really obviously designed uh, like a camera to, to take a picture. It's, it's, um, it's you know, structures there really to, as to um, take our vision. Um, and I have to say this is probably the most, one of the most crucial things um, is getting a good visual acuity um, is really helpful to understand and kind of set up a scene of, of what's going on with the eye. Um, um, a lot of places have what we call a Snellen chart, which is this thing that you can see on the, the left of the screen. Um, and this is um, basically um, how we measure distant vision and central vision. So um, a little bit different to reading vision. So if people uh, need reading glasses, it's a different, a different type of uh, visual test. But generally, this is the most common and uh, used uh, visual assessment um, in ophthalmology here in New Zealand and around the world. Um, as I say, most places have these. But even if you don't, um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, I've, I've downloaded a, um, a web uh, page that you can actually uh, print off of this. Um, and it just goes onto an A4 piece of paper. And I think from memory, it's, you, you, you put it on a wall and you get the patient to stand around about three meters away um, and take a vision. Um, and just to be aware that a lot of the, these sort of Snellen charts you download from the internet are actually based in feet. So they're, they're kind of the American um, Snellen charts and they have, that's where you get your 2020 vision from. Whereas in New Zealand, we use the um, 66, which is in meters. Um, really important point I'd like to make when checking visual acuity is that you need to check each eye separately. Um, so on the, we have the RVA, which is the right visual acuity, and the LVA, which is the left visual acuity. Now the importance of doing each eye separately, in this example here, you can see the, on the right eye, you've got 660 vision, which is normally the, relates to the top letter. So not, not great vision whatsoever. Um, and the left visual acuity is much better at 6-9, which is um, down here, which is almost perfect vision. Um, if you didn't check each eye separately, um, what you tend to find is that um, uh, if you check them both together, the person would give you a vision of um, six, around about 6-9, and you'd actually probably miss that there's a, a problem with the vision on the right eye. So really important that when you're, when, um, you're checking a vision that you do it separately, um, 
do each eye separately. And either just a you know, simple hand covering or even a card or a piece of paper is really important uh, to use, basically. Um, the other really uh, thing I'd like to make a, a note of is that um, we need to, when you're checking visual acuity, we want the best corrected visual acuity. Really important uh, in terms of if someone wears glasses, which is the GLS here, or CL, which stands for contact lens, you actually ch we ch check the vision with um, their best corrective visual acuity. I get a lot of um, referrals from GPs for cataract surgery um, with a vision of, say, 660 on both eyes, unaided, um, which is obviously you know really quite poor vision and way below the driving standard. Uh, we get the patient into the eye clinic, find out that actually they're, they're short-sighted and they wear glasses for distance vision. And when you check them with their glasses, it's like 6'9", which is way, you know, much better than the driving standard is needed. Um, so if, if the, if the um, GP or the person referring the patient actually check with the best corrective vision, it tells us a lot more than just a simple, I can't be bothered or I, I haven't got time to find out if they actually wear glasses or contact lenses. So that's just a really, really important point is to find out what is the best corrective visual acuity if they're wearing glasses or contact lenses. And of course, if they are wearing glasses, don't check with reading glasses because that's obviously going to give you a reading vision and give you quite a poor result. Um, you just need to make sure if they've got distance glasses or driving glasses that they're putting those on to wear. Um, the other really important point with visual acuity is that um, if their vision is worse than six over nine, so on the left eye, it's, it's, it's okay, it's at the threshold, but on the right eye, this is quite a poor vision. As I said before, it's, it denotes the top letter, which pretty much means that a person with normal vision of what we call six, six, which is perfect vision, um, that um, a six over 60 vision would mean that the person, person with perfect vision could actually walk back 60 meters and still see the letter A. So it's just telling you how bad that person's vision is, who's got six over 60. But any vision that's worse than six over nine, we like to get a pinhole. Um, and what I mean by that is just a, a little hole. Um, and if you're, if you're taking a vision, the simplest way is to get an 18 gauge needle and stick it through a piece of paper or a card and get the person to actually, again, separately, check the vision through that little hole against the Snellen chart. Um, and the reason that we do that is that it gives us a lot of information if their vision improves. So in this example here, you can see the person has a vision of uh, 6 over 60 on their right eye, quite poor, but with the pinhole down the bottom here, they've got a vision over 6 over 12, which has improved quite markedly. And that tells us quite a lot. It tells me um, that potentially there is a refractive error, which means that somewhere along the way, um, their vision is actually getting um, um, out of focus, basically, when it goes to the back of the eye. And that could be because of a cataract, that could be because they need glasses or the current glasses they have are actually um, out of date. Um, but it also importantly tells me that the back of the eye on the retina is actually working well. So if this person here with a 6 over 60 vision and we pinholed them and their vision didn't improve whatsoever and it was still 6 over 60, um, that tells me potentially that there's a, a problem with the retina at the back of the eye. So it's a, again, it's a really important um, assessment to make when you're taking a visual acuity. Um, so just going to go through a couple of obviously the common um, things that we find in the eye. So we'll start with a case study of Mrs. Uh, sorry, Mr. S, 71 year old man who's had gradual deterioration in vision, um, also on the left eye than the right. Um, he gets problems with glare, particularly while driving at night, but he has no symptoms of pain or redness. This is quite a common finding of uh, someone of this sort of age. Um, you can see the vision has been taken here, 6 over 12 on the right eye. It does pinhole up to quite well, 6 over 7.5. And the left eye, 6 over 18, and that's unaided. So these are unaided visions, and it pinholes up to 6 over 9. So this is telling me this gentleman doesn't wear glasses. His vision does seem to improve. So I can probably work out that his retina is probably working okay. Um, and just taking from, particularly with someone who's that age, with a general deterioration vision with glare, um, you can probably already start thinking uh, that this is probably related to a cataract. And sure enough, so this a cataract is basically a clouding of the lens in the eye, and it's the major cause of treatable blindness in the world. Um, the lens, just to remind you, is a, the focusing part of the eye, which lies just posterior to the, to the iris. 
um, behind the pupil there. So the risk factors for cataract surgery is um, actually not wearing a tiara that doesn't cause uh, cataract, but age is probably the most common uh, reason for developing a cataract. Um, probably the next sort of seven things on the slide there are modifiable risk factors to some degree. So geographic location, uh, what I mean by that, so countries unfortunately like New Zealand which have quite high UV light, UV light has been um, found to be uh, basically an increased risk for formation of cataract in the eye. Diabetes definitely, um, and we see um, cataract um, formation in people with diabetes, particularly diabetes that's not well controlled, a lot earlier than what you'd expect the general population to get a cataract, which is sort of in your late 60s, 70s, 80s. So people with poorly controlled diabetes, I often see um, reasonably dense cataracts, sometimes uh, early as in their 40s and definitely in their 50s. Uh, poor nutrition, which thankfully we don't really see too much in New Zealand, uh, but definitely in third world countries where um, uh, particularly with um, um, places such as India or Africa, you find that really poor nutrition can exacerbate cataract uh, formation because the, the, the lens in the eye is so sensitive to, to change in fluid balances um, as such. So again, as I say, we don't see this often in New Zealand, thankfully, um, but definitely an overseas problem. Steroid use, very, very common cause of um, cataract formation. So I think of people with things like um, asthma inhalers, um, people uh, who use sort of steroid cream around or near the eye for things like rosacea, you'll often find that this causes cataracts um, to, to come on a lot sooner. X-rays have been shown to cause this, of course, smoking, uh, any chance we get to, uh, to basically um, get people to see if they can stop smoking and definitely we can link smoking with cataract formation. And of course, trauma is um, uh, uh, another reason. And the other one is genetics, which of course is not a modifiable risk, but um, we do find that some people who particularly get earlier cataracts than you would expect with none of, none of the other risk factors here, it's often related to their genetics. And if you um, look in a bit closer, a bit further um, with their history, you'll find out that maybe their father or mother or an uncle or aunt or something like that has had cataracts at quite an early age and there's probably a genetic component for them forming an early cataract. Um, so just some pertinent points around cataracts. Um, if the cataract is quite early, um, it can be improved with uh, the vision with glasses. And as I, if I go back to that earlier, well, some of the referrals that I get from uh, into the eye clinic that don't um, actually include a glasses vision, um, you find that their vision can be improved quite uh, markedly with glasses, not all the time, but quite a lot. And potentially you can avoid a surgery by you know, telling them to go and visit their optometrist and actually improve their vision. Um, and one of the ways we can often find with that is that if, if, they, if the pinhole uh, vision, that um, if it's done, which often it's not, you will actually find um, that their vision will improve quite a lot. And that tells me, or tells us basically that, that there's a refractive error that glasses may help with, um, with the vision. Uh, the reason I say is, is cataract surgery is not without complications. It's probably one of the most common surgeries uh, in the world, but um, it's, it's not risk-free like, you know, any surgery, there's no risk-free surgery, but probably about one in, uh, sorry, about five out of every hundred uh, cataract uh, cases, you get some form of complication. Now, they, they, they are mostly minor, thankfully, um, but you can get a couple of, you know, quite complicated complications. Um, and even up to about one in a thousand, you can get total vision loss. So that's not, you know, completely without risk. So I always say to patients when I see them in the clinic and I'm assessing them for cataract surgery, that if they feel that, you know, the cataract is annoying, if it's annoying, but it's not actually affecting their day-to-day -day life, they can still read and drive and they're still safe to drive and within the legal um, parameters. Um, then I often say to them, is it, do they feel that the risk, even though it's very small, is it worth taking? And you'll often, patients will often, you know, weigh it on balance and find that, you know, if they're actually coping with day-to-day -day life, then, you know, they can delay the surgery. Um, the other point about um, cataract um, in the public system is it's based on a prioritisation from the Ministry of Health. Um, and you have to gain a certain amount of points in the public system to be able to, to be eligible for surgery. Now, most of that is based on 
how bad or poor the vision is, but there's also factors of how it's affecting your lifestyle. And there's a questionnaire around this set up by the Ministry of Health. Um, the other point I need to make though is different DHBs um, have different thresholds for how many points you need to get. Um, and even in Auckland with our three um, DHBs with Auckland and Waitamata and counties, there's quite a big difference between those three DHBs, and that's just, you know, based in the Auckland, greater Auckland area, uh, for how many points you need to get um, cataract surgery. And that's often related to resources, um, just how many patients in the community are going to need cataract surgery. Um, so just to bear in mind that some uh, patients basically who um, uh, are, are coming, uh, you know, listed for surgery in some areas, they'll get it depending on where they live and won't in, in other places. And I mean, that's, there's possible ethics around that, but that's just the way um, it's been set up at the moment. Um, another thing to just say is that post-surgery, post-cataract surgery, people can develop what we call a posterior capsular thickening. So that's not a new cataract. People once have had cataract surgery and had, had the natural lens removed, and basically it's a little special artificial plastic lens that's put in its place. You can't grow a cataract again, but you can develop a bit of posterior capsular thickening. That's probably around about sort of 10 to 20% of people can get that. Um, and this can cause a, quite a drop in their vision again. Um, this can be fixed relatively quickly. You don't have to go back to theater or surgery for this. It's just a simple laser procedure in the clinic. Um, but it's something just to bear in mind for people who've had that cataract surgery, that if their vision drops in the future, this could be the cause for it. And the other thing I just need to be mindful is that a lot of patients or most patients are actually going to need reading glasses post cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is not a fix all like a panacea for um, taking out the natural lens and you've got perfect vision both near and far. Um, most people elect to have sort of distance vision because that's what we use to drive and TV. Um, but a lot of, not a lot, but I, there's probably a reasonable amount of people if they haven't been um, carefully worked up when they're having their cataract surgery, a little bit disgruntled, I suppose, to say when they realize that they have to wear glasses, reading glasses afterwards, after their surgery, because their near vision, um, uh, when you've had your cataract surgery, it is not accommodated for that. You can, it's normally, as I say, only for distance vision. So it's always good to warn patients that generally they're gonna have to have their um, reading, uh, they're gonna have to use reading glasses after their surgery if they want to. Um, now, another really common, quite common condition that we find is glaucoma, which we kind of define in two types, primary open angle glaucoma, which is by far the most common, um, and primary angle closure glaucoma, which is thankfully not that common, and is also an acute emergency, which is why I put the red flag there. Um, primary open angle glaucoma, as, as you can see there, is insidious, so it's a, sort of a gradual onset, and it tends to take away your peripheral vision. So as we said before, when, when we're doing the, if we go back to that vision chart, when we're doing someone's distance vision, that is uh, assessing for central vision. Someone's got advanced um, glaucoma. Um, doing a, a, a vision on a Snellen chart will not pick up that they've got a problem because it affects their peripheral vision, their kind of what we call their side vision. And you can have quite advanced vision loss um, before central vision starts to get affected. Um, and it's often related to eye pressure, what we call intraocular pressure. Um, the normal pressure is generally between 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. Um, and we'll find that with both these two conditions, primary open angle glaucoma and angle closure glaucoma, the um, pressure is raised. So just talking about primary open angle glaucoma a bit more in depth, um, the incidence is around about one in 10 people over the age of 70. Um, a lot less for people over the age of 40, but it's still, you know, one in every 50 people over 40 have got possible, will, will have signs uh, and symptoms of glaucoma. Um, and generally, we, we say that most patients, sorry, most people, once you're over the age of 40, should actually go and have a vision test, um, test with your optometrist just to rule out that hopefully you're not one of those, the one in 50 person who potentially can have this problem, because this is definitely a treatable problem. Um, and the earlier um, you can pick it up and treat it, um, basically the less, the less problems you have in the future. Once you get damage to your peripheral vision, you can't, you can't get that back. Um, we call it the silent thief of vision. 
as I said before, there's, there's basically no pain uh, or redness involved with this. You can't tell the person's got it. There's no red eye or pain. And in the late stage, you get what we call this uh, thing called tunnel vision, um, which I think I've got a picture of here. So in, in the slide here, you've got normal vision that someone would see on the, on the left side, the right eye. This is someone with advanced glaucoma. Uh, again, it's basically they've lost a lot of their peripheral field and they've just got the central, central area left in the middle there. Um, it's often found, incidentally, in an optometrist check. So someone who's, who's kind of getting to their 40s anyway will get something called presbyopia, which is where you start having problems with um, reading and you tend to start looking further and further away. Um, and this is when often people go to the optometrist and get their sort of vision check, and this is where it gets picked up. Um, it's normally the pressure of the eye is raised above 21 millimeters of mercury, above that normal, and it's diagnosis of um, uh, a range of things that need to give you a, a, a formative diagnosis of high pressure, um, visual field change, and also the optic nerve appearance. Um, there's a, specific, a particular type of nerve appearance when you can see someone with damage to the optic nerve from, from glaucoma. Age is definitely a risk factor to talked about, but so is family. If, if you've got someone in your family, a close family member with glaucoma, you've got a four to nine times risk of developing glaucoma yourself. The treatment is, and the, the mainstay is basically, in um, the first instance, is antihypertensive eye drops. Normally, you start with a monotherapy, and then if uh, the pressure is not controlled at the level that we want it, well, then we can bring in um, polytherapy with more eye drops. And if that's not working, then we can go to a laser procedure. And sort of the late stage uh, and sort of, of last resort was to actually go ahead and do um, a proper uh, glaucoma surgery. Um, just to kind of show you a picture, so a normal eye on the left-hand side, on the right, it's kind of showing, I'm not sure if you can see if, how clear that is, but basically it's where there's a buildup of, of um, fluid, the aqueous humor in the eye gets kind of uh, a blockage into what we call the trabecular meshwork, which is like the drainage part of the eye. And what happens is you get a back pressure that goes to the back of the eye, and that's where the pressure can cause damage to the optic nerve. Um, and that, as I say, if you start getting damage to the nerve, once you get some form of damage that's irreversible, you can't get that back. So the sooner it gets picked up, the better. Um, the second case study is just around a, a Mrs. M, who's a 75-year-old lady, presented to the emergency clinic after being at the movies. So presenting complaint, her right eye had a marked drop in vision, as you can see there, 6 over 45 unaided on the side here. At Mild improvement with Pinot, but still quite poor vision at 6.30, left eye was unaffected. Um, came in with severe pain and nausea, very red eye, um, no discharge basically. And as you can see underneath that, the pressure that was taken on that eye, 50 millimeters of mercury. So that's about two and a half times the normal eye pressure of someone's eye. And this is uh, extremely painful and often associated, as I've said before with this person, with nausea. And we've had actually patients present not to the eye clinic, uh, but to like an um, emergency department, not realizing that they basically turn up with a lot of nausea and vomiting, not realizing that this, the whole process is actually because they've got high pressure in the, in the eye. And this is what we call primary open angle, sorry, primary angle closure, I should say, primary angle closure glaucoma. This is an acute eye emergency. Thankfully, it's, it's not that common. Um, and the risk factors tend to be um, age. So over 50, we find this is more common. Female, unfortunately, tends to have a, a, a two to one uh, predilection for this occurring. Um, what we call a hypermetropic, which is a short eye. So it's an eye that's actually shorter than normal. Um, and all these things we believe are caused because the eye is actually quite crowded. It's, it's as you get older, um, uh, over 50, what we, as we talked before, you start developing a cataract. Um, and the cataract start, when you actually get a cataract, it actually starts fattening up. Um, and this can actually squash some of the structures in the eye. And this can actually, what we call, affect um, and cause this problem. So if we look in this picture here, this is a picture basically of the, the front of the eye from the lens forward to the cornea. On the left side is, is what we call a normal eye. So you've got your, your lens here, um, there's your iris and your cornea. And in between the cornea, and the iris, so we've got this area called um, the, an angle. And that's where, under the corner of the angle is the trabecular mesh where, where the fluid in the eye that gets made gets drained away. And on the right, um, what's happened is that uh, someone has got basically probably a, a slightly enlarged 
um, lens, probably from an early cataract. That what it does, it pushes the, the lens forward, uh, I'm sorry, the lens, the iris forward right against the cornea. So there's almost no place for the fluid to drain. And it basically becomes uh, quite a, uh, turns into a nasty loop because the more pressure that comes behind here, the more this iris is pushed forward to the basically, there's no way for the fluid to go away and the pressure goes up exponentially. And the concern with that is if you get a pressure that's sort of into the 50s and 60s, that back pressure to the optic nerve will basically stop the arterial blood flow to the eye um, and cause massive ischemia and pretty much death of the eye. So this is a, a um, um, ocular emergency that needs to be dealt with almost immediately. This patient, when they came into the clinic, um, really red eye, as I've said before, the cornea was very hazy simply because the pressure in the eye, the fluid, our normal fluid in the eye, which we call aqueous humor, was getting pushed into the cornea. It was basically turning the cornea into a kind of a soft, boggy mess. Um, this is why you get a hazy cornea. Um, the pupil is often found to be fixed and dilated because the pressure is so high, your pupil cannot dilate or constrict. Um, and that's why we call it sort of semi-dilated. Pressure, as I said, is very, very high, pain severe, and we often find patients that have got nausea and vomiting in regards to this. Ocular emergency, basically, the relief, the, to relieve this is we, we give them intensive anti-hypertensive eye drops. Um, sometimes we have to give them oral diamox, uh, which basically will just help to try and draw the fluid out of the eye. Um, and if none of those work, then sometimes we have to do a laser procedure where we fire a small burn hole right through the iris to try and relieve the, the pressure, basically. Um, and pretty much, uh, you know, if this is left for anything longer than 12 hours, you're probably gonna have some reasonably significant damage to the eye, unfortunately. Um, so now we'll kind of go back to uh, look for, um, to uh, sort of retinal conditions that we see quite often in the eye clinic. Um, so macular degeneration, uh, posterior vitreous detachment and retinal detachment. Macular degeneration, I've kind of, um, it's, it's, it's both uh, an acute problem and not acute problem, depending on the type of macular degeneration, which we'll talk about shortly. Retinal detachment is definitely a, an acute problem, which is why I red flagged it. And again, I'll talk about that um, shortly. So just to remind you, the retina uh, is, again, if we think of a camera, it's like the film of the camera. It takes the picture. Um, you've got in the center of uh, the back of the eye, the macula is the part that's responsible for our central vision. So if we go back right back to the vision chart, when you're taking someone's vision on that Snellen chart and we said we're doing someone's distance and central vision, this area, the macula, that's the area that's responsible for taking um, the, uh, our central vision, basically. So age-related macular degeneration, obviously, is a degenerative disease of the retina and in particular the macula. Um, about one in seven people over the age of 50 will have some form of macular degeneration, which is actually you know, quite a common disease. Um, not necessarily a, a form of macular degeneration that's causing significant uh, visual problems, thankfully, um, but that's still a relatively high number for people around about 50 or over who've got some form of macular degeneration. And as you get older, this tends to uh, increase, uh, as it you know, related to in the title there, age-related. Um, and probably by the time people are into the 80s, it's about one in four people will have some form of macular degeneration. So this is quite a, um, a, a common disease or eye disease in New Zealand and in the Western world, because it seems to affect more Caucasian people than other ethnicities. Although there is a subtype of this disease we see in sort of the um, sub-Asian sort of India, um, around that era, China, those sort of, um, those areas, there's a subtype of macular degeneration, but very common in, in Caucasian people. And obviously, with our aging population, we are seeing more and more people with this disease. Um, so we divide macular degeneration into two areas. This is quite an old term, what we call dry and wet macular degeneration. Uh, we often now talk about active and non-active um, macular degeneration, but um, we still you know, tend to use these terms. So dry macular degeneration um, is basically where um, you get lipid particles uh, that are getting caught, uh, we call them drusen, between the choroid and the retina. So the choroid is the vascular layer, um, and then you've got the inner layer is the retina. So there's a, there's a basically problem between those two 
um, structures where um, waste products of sort of lipids um, are getting caught in between these two areas, between un basically under the retina. Um, and in the early stages, they don't really cause a problem. So if you, you look at the back of someone's eye with dry macular degeneration, normal eye on the left here, and on the right, you see these sort of yellowish sort of little spots all over the back of the retina. And this is what we call soft drusen. And as I say, in the early stages, this doesn't tend to cause a problem. Um, and a lot of people, this doesn't actually um, progress on from this. It just stays like this. Thankfully, it doesn't cause any visual problems for them. Um, it's just that they had a, you know, a vision check at their optometrist that would be noted that they have some sort of form of macular degeneration, which we call you know, dry macular degeneration. Um, it, the problem, of course, is that um, it can progress for uh, a reason, you know, a moderate number of people, and people start to get gradual changes in their vision. Now, as opposed to when we talked about glaucoma before, that affects the peripheral vision, and people often won't pick that up, but in um, macular generation, this affects what we call the central vision, so this area right in front of in front of the eye there. Um, and it's often very gradual, and people often don't pick it up straight away, because it can happen over many, many years. Um, what they'll often say is, oh, my, my night vision seems to be getting a little bit worse, um, and or on a cloudy day, I just can't read as well, and, and bright light seems to make a huge difference for them. Um, there's no actual treatment uh, that we've found that um, can stop or um, basically eradicate not eradicate, but basically fits macular, dry macular degeneration. It's still a disease entity. We don't 100% know what the cause is, although we, we know that there is probably um, genetics involved in this, and there's definitely uh, people with a close family history have got a higher chance of this. Smoking is the, mo is the only modifiable risk that we know that can reduce the progression of macular degeneration. So if someone's a smoker, uh, another reason to tell them not smoking because it can exacerbate or progress the macular degeneration. And the other thing is people over the age of 60 um, tend to gonna, uh, you know, have a higher risk of having this. Um, the problem with dry macular degeneration for those people who progress is that sometimes these drusenoid spots tend to become confluent. They actually basically form together into one big clump. And what you can get is, if I just show you a picture here, is this is macular degeneration, still dry, um, but the, those little clumps have basically become one big um, conformed kind of area. Uh, and this unfortunately tends to cause one massive fibrotic scar. Um, and this sits right under what we call the, the retinal pigment epithelial layer. This is the basement membrane that supports all our, um, our, uh, our photoreceptors, which are the, the nerves that help us to see. And if you lose this area, if this becomes fibrose, basically um, the cells die. So it's a bit like if you think of forest and, and someone comes along and is able to kill all the soil, all those trees are basically going to die. And that's pretty much what happens with um, macular, dry macular degeneration that progresses over time uh, to a point that we call it end-stage macular degeneration. And unfortunately, these people, their central vision is extremely poor. So six, six over 60 or less count fingers, hand movements, that, that it's quite poor vision. And unfortunately, um, central vision or macular generation that affects central vision, this is the stuff we use to drive, read. So this really is a, quite a debilitating disease for a lot of people, really. Um, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, they lose their independence because of this disease. And as I said before, there's no known treatment for this yet because as yet we fully don't understand why the disease actually occurs. Um, just going back to this picture before, this just kind of shows what actually the drusen looks like in a microscopic level. So here we've got the, the retina at the back of the eye, you get these little yellowish spots on the back there. If we're actually able to look right down here, this area here is the, the choroid, so that's the vascular layer at the back of the eye. Um, and then inside that you've got the, the retina. So you've got your, when I said before, you've got this thing called a retinal pigment epithelium, which is the basement membrane that supports the photoreceptors, which is the nerves that help us to see. So you've got to, basically the choroid's um, job is to um, feed and nourish the retina. But with macular generation, these drusens, um, basically these little lipid proteins that get caught up in between the, the vascular layer and underneath the retinal pigment epithelial layer, and they cause a little pushing up here. And that's, that's what you see on the microscopic level there. This is basically what someone with macular, quite an end stage macular degeneration are gonna see. So 
you know, complete loss of central vision. They're not blind. So a lot of people with macular degeneration uh, are fearful. To be fair, it's quite uh, understandable that they're actually going to go blind. They're not going to be blind in terms, in the sense of completely complete loss of vision, but what we call functional blindness because you've lost your central vision. As you can see in this picture here, you can still see peripherally, but the central vision is completely gone. So if you're trying to recognize people's faces, read a book, um, watch TV, um, drive, all those things are impossible. It's physically impossible to do that. Um, the next case study that I'm talking about is an 82 year old lady who noticed two weeks ago, so quite recently, an onset of um, decreased vision in her left eye associated with a black spot. And if I go back to this picture, this is basically what she was seeing. Um, and um, there was no trauma in regards to this, no pain or redness or any discharge. Um, and this is in her left eye. The right eye was good vision, left eye, as you can see there. Uh, reasonably poor vision and importantly when we did the pinhole no improvement whatsoever so immediately if I was looking at this if a referral came in with this this type of thing with a quite a recent history two weeks no red eye no pain no trauma with a vision of about this and with doesn't improve the pinhole and an 82 year old person probably the first thing I'm thinking of is um, macular degeneration and what we call the old um, wet macular degeneration when we took a photo, we had a look at the back of this lady's eye, right in the middle of that area of the, the back of the retina where the macula is, is a large bleed has happened. So um, if we go back to our picture that we kind of saw uh, before at the microscopic level, this time, um, here's the retinal layers here, the retinal pigment epithelial layer, which is that kind of orangey layer here. And then underneath it, here's your vascular, the choroid. And what's happened here is that the those drusenoid um, uh, that we see before in dry macular generation, when they um, progress enough, um, the eye tries to compensate by growing new blood vessels, so near vascularization of the choroid. But unfortunately, this whole process and complex tends to bleed and cause rapid um, blood into the back of the eye, which is what we can see here, and that can cause rapid loss of vision. And if left untreated, um, will cause a massive fibrotic scar and the vision will be... Um, well, what you saw there, 6.30 or far worse, actually tends to be a lot worse than that. Um, there is, uh, thankfully, though, wet macular degeneration only really occurs in about 10% of cases. So it's thankfully not that as common as dry macular degeneration, um, but we can treat it. Um, and we can treat it with um, intravitreal um, medication. So the most common treatment in New Zealand that we use is Avastin, um, which is actually a bowel cancer drug. So um, back in about 2004, 2005, um, some bright ophthalmologist realized that Avastin, which was used for bowel cancer to um, basically call, shrivel up the, the blood supply to tumor cells, um, they were able to realize, they thought, you know, can we use this uh, um, in the eye for macular degeneration? Lo and behold, it actually works. In New Zealand, uh, actually most places in the world, it's, it's off license. So we don't um, th this is not actually, uh, Avastin is not prescribed for the eye, um, but this is, we, we give this off license for macular degeneration in New Zealand. And probably around about 80 to 85% of patients uh, having um, treatment for wet macular degeneration in New Zealand receive Avastin. The other two medications under the ILEA and Lucentis are Pharmac only approval. Um, uh, probably about two or three years ago, Lucentis was. The, um, the first, um, basically, uh, drug for Vastin didn't work that we could um, go to, but ILEA has now overtaken that. Um, and we ha you have to prove, basically, that Avastin is not working. So you have to generally try three treatments of Avastin every four weeks to see if that will improve um, the bleeding at the back of the eye. And if it doesn't, you can apply to Phar Pharmac to actually um, go on to ILEA. These are quite expensive medications. They're about $2,000 an injection. And if someone's receiving regular injections, which sometimes can be up to eight or 10 or even 12 times a year, it's obviously quite a high burden on, um, well, Pharmac and obviously the taxpayer, um, which is why they, they limit um, ILEA to only those patients who don't respond to Avastin. So basically, um, people receiving an intravitreal injection, this is probably what it looks like. Um, and what you're doing is giving an injection uh, of the medication into the back of the eye. And there's a small space that you can actually inject into the eye safely. 
uh, without causing um, problems uh, hitting any of the other structures. Um, and if you actually are able to open the eye, that's what it would look like. You're injecting a substance at the back of the, into the middle of the eye, into the vitreous of the eye, which is the middle part, and then the fluid goes to the back there uh, and hopefully will stop the blood supply from, from, um, from the leaking, basically. So that's, that's macular degeneration, wet and dry macular degeneration. Um, second case study on um, retinal problems is a uh, Mrs. P, a 76 year old lady who had a two week history of flashes in her left eye and then associated with what we call floaters. It's quite a common problem. Um, no real gross change in her vision, no pain and redness associated, no trauma or anything like that. Vision on the right eye was pretty good. Left eye, not too bad, still just within driving standard and she pinholes up, which again is an important thing. So it's telling me that the, the back of the eye, the retina and the macula are probably working all right. So what she actually um, had uh, developed was a posterior vitreous detachment. This is not a retinal detachment, this is a vitreous detachment. The vitreous is basically the jelly and the posterior part of the eye. Um, and it's very common in, uh, in the older person for that jelly to start to break up and to liquefy and cause these sort of floaters, which is what this lady experienced. Um, it's more common in people, what we call myopic eyes. So that's someone with a longer eye than, than normal um, because their vitreous is, they've got a larger volume of vitreous because they've got a bigger eye. And this tends to happen more in these type of patients. It's not usually sight threatening. Um, so it's not an acute problem. Um, people will get symptoms of flashes and floaters, but it is something that does need to probably be checked out because it, in some cases, probably around about 10%, it can lead to a retinal detachment, which is definitely a, an acute problem that needs um, prompt surgery. Um, so I've got a picture here of what, uh, so the, the white sort of stuff at the back of the eye, that's the, the vitreous. And what we tend to find, as I said before, as you get older, that basically liquefies and it starts to, dehiss or, or peel off the back of the retina. So the retina is normally left intact, which is what we want, but as the vitreous comes away from the retina, you get these little flashes, sparks of light, and sometimes small floaters. Um, but as I said before, it's normally benign, and normally um, it will kind of resolve by itself. Some people though are left with uh, permanent floaters in the eye, which can be kind of annoying. Um, but apart from having surgery to remove those, and I don't think you'll find many retinal doctors who will actually go ahead and do surgery just to remove a floater, um, it's unfortunately you're generally stuck with a floater. They, sometimes they get absorbed by the eye, but if they're quite big, um, uh, generally you just have to live with them, unfortunately. Um, the last case study on, the, on, on retinal problems is a, a gentleman, a 61 year old who presented with a one day loss of vision in his left eye. He described this enlarging black shadow affecting his central vision. And he had noticed, interestingly, seven days before that, that what he described as flashing lights and subsequent floaters. So very similar to the previous um, patient before that, but the, um, that's basically he, a large shadow had occurred in his vision. Um, no pain, discharge or redness in the eye. And you can see the vision on the right eye is good. The left eye though, massive drop, count fingers only. So CF stands for count fingers, no improvement pinhole. So again, that's telling me that he's not um, improving. Glasses probably won't improve. This is not really a glasses problem. And the back of the eye, the, the retina, and particularly the macula, something that's going on there. So sure enough, when we had a look at the, uh, the back of his eye, he's had what we call a retinal detachment. So this is definitely a sight threatening condition. This is where the you get a separation of the neural layer from the retinal pigment epithelium. So basically, it's the retina is peeling off the back of the eye. Um, often, uh, this, uh, generally, it's, it's um, idiopathic, so it can happen just out of the blue. We do see those um, more um, in patients with diabetes. Trauma, obviously, can cause this. Um, but most of the time, it's what we call idiopathic. We just don't know why it occurs, and basically, the, the, ret the retina peels off the back of the eye. Um, often you'll get these um, a large increase in floaters, so it's not just a couple of floaters, but I'd say like hundreds of floaters is often the, the one that I'd be worried about. And this dark, sh what people call like a curtain is coming across their vision. And this needs surgical intervention very quickly. And this picture here, um, we're actually going right to the back of the eye. So what we see is there's a, now actually a hole in the retina and that vitreous, that liquid light, that uh, gel in the, in the back of the eye is able now to go through under the retina and basically peel it off. 
Um, and if it peels off far enough down uh, and includes the area in the back of the eye where the macula is, so that's the area, as I said before, that's your central vision, um, that you can have a rapid loss of vision, as, as in this case with that gentleman who only had count fingers vision. And I always tell patients it's a little bit like wallpaper falling off the back of the wall. So that's kind of how I picture it to patients, that your, your retina is falling off like a wallpaper is falling off the back of the wall. And if you can get to it promptly, you can actually um, put that wallpaper and stick it back onto the eye. Um, but if you lose the whole lot and it takes the, the macula off, then generally you, you can stick it back on, but if it's affected the macula, um, vision is often um, uh, in a long term, it's not going to actually improve whatsoever. You're going to have quite poor vision in that eye. So prompt um, surgical intervention is, is, is basically what is needed for these patients. So another really, really, we're going now back forwards to, uh, to something. We've been at the back of the eye now. We're going forwards. Something that's really common, very, very common that we find is something called blepharitis. Um, so this is basically um, related to what we call dry eye disease. Um, and it's, it's, it's where the, the lid margin is inflamed um, and, and there's a lot of sort of bacteria buildup. We, we kind of um, base it into two different areas, what we call anterior and posterior blepharitis. So anterior blepharitis is where, if you look at the lashes under a microscope, you can see like clumps of um, sometimes just, you know, um, dandruff, which is a sort of seborrheic, seborrheic um, eyelash involvement, or quite a lot of gummy um, bacteria. You can actually see that around the back of the eyelashes. And when you get enough of these, you get sort of an almost like an inflammatory response on the eye. Um, and that causes problems with your tear film um, and can lead to things like dry eye symptoms. It's scratchy, feels like a foreign body sensation in the eye, often waters. Um, the eye can sometimes be quite red. Uh, so these conditions um, uh, are really, really common, both to young person, old person, male, female. Um, it, it doesn't seem to really have um, a, a predilection for any sort of different um, age group or gender or anything like that. Um, the other thing we find is posterior blepharitis is, is something that affects what we call the meibomian gland. So that's actually some oil glands in the eyelids, up in upper and lower eyelids, they're important because they release an oil into the tear film that allows the tear film to kind of um, stay on the back of the eye, uh, um, the tear film to kind of stick to the uh, onto the surface of the eye. Um, and if you lose that oil film from meibomian gland dysfunction, you basically get evaporation of the tears with a very, very dry eye. Um, the mainstay of treatment for these is basically to, uh, is what we call lid cares, um, which is really important uh, for patients if they can actually, um, uh, kind of hook into this because long term this will help actually improve a lot of people's um, blepharitis. And what it involves with is, is basically hot compress for at least two or three minutes of hot um, uh, basically onto the onto the eyelids, um, followed by lid massage. Um, so basically, you're gently pressing on the eyelids to kind of release the blocked uh, meibomian glands. Um, and I tell patients if you can do this once a day for three months, you can often improve the eye to such a um, state that you don't really need to worry about sort of um, treatment like eye drops or anything else. And um, you can potentially, um, going forward, keep, keep the eye nice and comfortable. Again, it's quite a tricky thing though for patients to actually hook into. A lot of them, when they come back and see me, They'll say, oh, I tried it for a couple of weeks and it, it didn't really work. And the key thing is it actually, it does take around about two or three months for, for this sort of treatment to actually stabilize the tears of the eye. Uh, and people often give up um, around about two or three weeks. So it's really important when I can see these patients to say, look, don't give up. This tends to take two or three months to work. It's not going to work over a day or a week or even a month. It's something you need to keep at it. Um, if we think the inflammation or the, 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 um, um, the blepharitis is, is quite pronounced and causing problems, then often a treatment we will try to kind of stabilize things to actually give them a short course of fusithalmic um, treatment twice a day for two weeks. Um, and the other thing we can think about also to try and stabilize the inflammatory response, which results from what we find when we've got too much bacteria around the eyelashes, is give them a short course of doxycycline um, in, a, in a sort of a mild form, only about 50 milligrams daily for about six weeks. Um, and we find that that often clears up the inflammatory component of the, of the blepharitis and particularly the bacterial involvement. Um, very important though, obviously doxycycline, um, not to give anyone uh, of childbearing age and always to check with females if 
they are pregnant or wanting to get pregnant because this can cause um, quite nasty effects on the baby. So it's not something to give, uh, obviously, if someone who is pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant, basically. Um, if we look at a picture of um, blephritis, so basically, um, here's the, on the top one here, this is anterior blephritis. I don't know sure how that picture comes through, but if you can see the lashes, right at the base of the lashes, a lot of um, buildup of, of one of a bit of a gunge, um, and that's kind of the um, sort of dandruff um, bacteria that you can get in the eyelashes. And as I say, those cause like an inflammatory response that causes then a dry eye problem onto the eye. Um, the other thing I didn't really talk about is we actually find sometimes there's also a little, uh, something called Demodex, which is actually a tiny little mite that lives on our body, on our skin, and that can actually burrow into the hair follicle. Um, and sometimes if you see what we call little collarettes, so that's like a little ring around the base of the lash of this sort of sludge, uh, to one of a better word, it's actually, um, it's actually the poo of the mite that actually comes out of it when they're actually pooing out the back. It's quite horrible, actually. Um, so this, these things, um, they've been looking into ways of um, treating Demodex uh, and um, blephritis. Um, and tea tree oil is actually something they've found to be quite um, helpful to basically kill off the Demodex mite and, and the problems associated. I have to say they've got to be really careful because tea tree is actually really, really quite strong. And if you start wiping that onto the eye, you could actually uh, cause yourself a corneal abrasion. So it's not something I'd probably say a person at home should be doing. But um, potentially um, a, a mild, mild form of tea tree oil, if it's demodex related, you can actually find, you can get some improvement in regards to that. The bottom picture is showing the, what we call posterior blepharis. And this is actually blocked my bomian glands. So these are these oil glands I was telling you about before that sit within the eyelids, both top and bottom. And it's where they basically, uh, the, the, the oils harden up and get blocked inside these oil glands. And if you avert, flip the eyelid up a little bit, you'll see these little blocked um, oil glands. And that's where heat and massage are really, really important because they will help to um, unblock these oil glands over a period of two to three months if you can tell the patient to stick at it doing once a day. A um, couple of um, things that you can get though from a blocked um, mybomian cyst, and that's these a um, couple of pictures here. So you can actually get something, uh, a small eyelid infection, uh, and that's where you get uh, inflammation and uh, mild infection of those blocked mybomian glands. And um, you can see definitely on the picture on the bottom here, quite a large swelling there. The, the important point to make is though, it looks probably, particularly the bottom picture, looks quite um, serious. But if you look at the back of the eye, the white of the eye, and it's white, that's actually a key sign. So this is actually telling me that this is just localized to the eyelid and the eyelids are, are quite easy to actually puff up if you have any changes there. The important bit is that the, the, the conjunctiva of the eye is white. So it's, it's not, this ear, this uh, blocked um, mybomian gland is related only to the front of the eye. I'd be far more concerned and worried if, the, if you got um, uh, conjunctivitis or, or some sort of inflammation of the conjunctiva, because that's telling me that the, the, um, the, the swelling has now actually spread behind the eye uh, to become potentially an orbital cellulitis, which is actually um, both sight-threatening and potentially um, life-threatening if, if it can actually get in behind uh, the sinuses, into the sinuses and back into the brain there. So I always look, if someone's got a lump on the eyelid like this, um, look at the eye, if it's white, far more um, relaxed, so to speak. The treatment for this basically, again, is hot compress. We actually want these to burst. So heat and massage is really important, but if someone's got this type of situation, I'd actually tell them to use probably at least three or four times a day of heat onto the eye for at least four or five minutes, and then massage, try and massage it there, and we actually want that to rupture, uh, if we can. Um, these uh, often, though, will... Despite doing that, patients you know, try it for weeks and weeks, they don't go away. And the only real way of actually getting rid of them is actually to do um, uh, a small uh, incision and, and drainage onto these bases. Well, not so much drainage, but incision and curatage. You actually try and scrape out the, the, um, the gunk that's caused up in the eyelids. But generally what we want, hopefully, is for them to, to spontaneous rupture by themselves with heat and massage. That's the best way for these, for these things to heal. Um, just to go on the... Uh, Though that if um, blepharitis goes um, advanced, you can actually get this thing called marginal keratitis. Now this is actually an ulcer right on the peripheral margin of the eye. Um, you can see here, this is the eye is quite um, inflamed with the, the conjunctiva. And if you stay in the eye, you see these little ulcers right on the peripheral part of the eye. So this is potentially um, 
you know, there's an acute problem that needs to be seen because um, if you have a corneal ulcer, these can, if they go bad, perforate uh, and, um, and you've got all sorts of problems if you've got a perforated eye. So just really quickly, the last topic I'll talk about is, is red eye. Um, so I see I'm running out of time here. Um, just the, the key points for the red eye, lots of things can cause a red eye. As I've said just before, the one, the picture just before, marginal keratitis, you've got a red eye here and related to a, an ulcer. Um, really important to note if, is to basically work, uh, take a history, if the vision is reduced with a red eye and if pain is present with a red eye, there is warning signs going off. I'd red flag those a little bit. And if both those things have come in together, huge red flag. There's something uh, definitely that needs to be um, chased pretty quickly. Um, discharge, um, often an important thing that tells us a little bit what's going on, but really it's vision and pain that, that tells me um, are the two key things that I'm looking at with a red eye. And history is really important, particularly any red eye patient, always work out, do they wear contact lenses? Um, contact lens wear, always a red flag for um, if someone comes in red eye, potentially they've got um, a corneal ulcer, um, but which you need to, you know, needs to be carefully managed because that can go quite nasty. Viral illnesses are really important. They had a recent viral illness because um, viral conjunctivitis is often a really, really common sign. Trauma, that's obviously something we need to find out. And systemic disease can often be associated with red eye. So a table here I've just got here that looks at a couple of things. So um, sort of six reasons for conjunctivitis. There are more than this, but these are the common ones. Conjunctivitis is a cause for red eye. Subconjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, hemorrhage. Keratitis, which is inflammation of the cornea. Iritis, which is inflammatory condition of the eye. Acute glaucoma, we talked about before, you get a very severe red eye with this, and this is a, you know, a, a, an ocular emergency. And the other sort of inflammatory conditions you can find are episcleritis and scleritis. Um, again, if we go back, so vision with conjunctivitis is normally not affected. Pain is not normally that much, a bit of grittiness is normally, and obviously watery, allergic, viral, perilent discharge. So you can get a whole lot of different uh, causes for um, conjunctivitis. Um, uh, Subconjunctival sub hemorrhage, um, this is, uh, actually I've got a couple of slides here to have a look at. Um, oh, sorry, just back to this, I'll go back to the conjunctivitis. Um, if you have this kind of, I mean, <laughs> a normal life never looks like this, a, a, like a nice, lovely picture. But if you look here, uh, um, the normal eye compared to a bacterial conjunctivitis, a red eye, these have all got red eye, but you look for sort of purulent discharge around the lashes, in the fornix area of the eye that will often tell you that's a bacterial conjunctivitis. We tend to swab any conjunctivitis anyway to work out what's going on. Viral conjunctivitis will give you a lot of um, hyperemia, a lot of um, epiphoria, which is a lot of watery eye, but you don't get the sort of the pussy discharge around it. Allergic conjunctivitis looks very similar to viral. You get a watery discharge, but around the eyelids, you often get a lot more um, erythema, so a lot more uh, inflammation around the actual eyelids as opposed to the not, not so much with viral conjunctivitis. Um, and as I said before, so bacteria, um, vision is often normal with all these um, conditions and pain is sort of minimal with all those as well. Um, uh, but you often get different discharges there and it depends on what, what's going on there. So bacteria we normally treat with chlorophenicol. Um, viral is normally treated, we just let it run its course. Um, we don't normally treat that with anything, but very strict hygiene is really important as with um, bacterial and allergic conjunctivitis, um, often treat with antihistamines and mass um, cell stabilizers as well. Um, and just quickly, subcon subconjunctival hemorrhage is probably the one that looks out of all these pictures, looks actually the worst. Uh, when you look at this, you think oh, it's absolutely nasty, but this is probably the most benign of them all. Most times it's idiopathic, um, uh, often caused though by rubbing the eye or sneezing or coughing. Um, or rapid eye movement is the one that we're often finding that people are actually coming out of a sleep, so um, waking up after a sleep or a nap in the afternoon, uh, rapid eye movement of the eyes actually causes this condition to cause a bleed on the eye. The key is vision is normal, pain is nil, discharge, management is just time basically. So topical lubricants normally, if, if it's a little bit gritty, that's about the most important thing. Um, Pauline, I think I've run out of time. Um, I can keep talking or... I've got a few more slides, but do you want me to finish it up there? Why don't we just answer a couple of questions and then, okay. um, and then you can finish and people who aren't in a rush can hang on. Uh, sure. there's, only, there's only a couple of questions. What is a short eye and how could you recognise it? Um, you, you couldn't um, unless... Uh, so a short eye is basically what we call a, 
Um, someone with long distance, funny enough, so it's, it's a bit of a misnomer, but a short eye uh, is someone who has long distance. So they can see really well in the distance, but really poor close up. Um, there's no way to actually tell just by looking at someone if they've got a short eye. The only way to tell really is to, is, um, is to do what we call a special machine that measures the axial length. Um, but people with a short eye are more, uh, as I said before, at risk of primary angle closure glaucoma, which is an ocular emergency if that occurs. Thank you. And um, is there a, rela a relationship between elevated blood pressure and glaucoma? Um, no, not really. Um, I, I get a lot of patients with glaucoma when they're di diagnosed with glaucoma. And when you say you've got a high eye pressure, the first thing you do is you've got to try and pick apart to say this is actually not related to your blood pressure. Um, and a high blood pressure doesn't tend to cause a high eye pressure. They're uh, two separate systems completely. Um, uh, again, glaucoma, like macular degeneration, like a lot of eye diseases, we still don't 100% know why, why it occurs. Um, but high blood pressure, not really a causative factor for high eye pressure, two separate systems. Right. Um, and um, people are keen for you to continue the rest of your presentation. There's just one more question in the meantime. After removing a corneal foreign body, should we give chloramphenicol drops or ointment or neither? Um, the, it's a little, I, yeah, no, I probably definitely would give um, uh, antibiotics. If you've had an epithelial defect with a foreign body, it well, it depends if it's actually caused a, a scratch on the cornea. So if it's just sitting on the surface, like there's like an eyelash or a, a bit of lint or something like that, and it hasn't actually caused a corneal abrasion. So if you do a little bit of fluorescein and stain the eye, and with a little blue light, which you can find on a lot of ophthalmoscopes and, and, uh, and practices out there. If you can't see any staining on the eye, then no, I don't think you need any antibiotics. As soon as you've got an epithelial defect of some sort, yes, I think you would definitely want some sort of coverage. And we normally say to patients, um, one drop three times a day for three days or five days should be enough to, to kind of allow the cornea to heal. The cornea is very fast at healing, would normally take about 24 to 48 hours and it's healed. So we just really want some coverage over that time to allow the corneal layers to, to heal over so you haven't got any sort of secondary bacterial infection into the, into the cornea. Cool. Um, I'd like to invite you to just finish off your presentation because there's people keen to see it. Yes. And there might be a couple more questions coming in in the meantime, but is okay. that all right with you, David? Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, so as we said before, so subconjunctival hemorrhage it looks probably the worst of all of them, um, but because the vision is normal, pains and ill discharge, it's not something we really need to worry about, um, and time will normally heal this. Um, keratitis, this is definitely a red flag. So keratitis is inflammation of the cornea, um, and there are probably three main things that, that we worry about the most with keratitis. On the left there by itself is what we call mi microbial keratitis, so some sort of... Um, uh, uh, bacteria or fungal infection of the eye um, and that's where we get the uh, the term really when you see a corneal ulcer. Um, on the top right of the screen here you get these funny little patterns on the eye when you stain them. Uh, this is what we call a dendritic ulcer and this is commonly what you see with someone with the herpes virus, herpes simplex, so the, the cold sore virus. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the bottom picture here is not that clear, I'm really sorry, but uh, I don't know if you can tell, but the corner itself is quite hazy. Um, and this is um, uh, basically a keratitis caused by shingles, the shingles virus, um, so we called a herpes zoster. Um, so these three things, sorry, I've just got to let my dog out. She just, I think she's, <laughs> give me a moment. <laughs> That's the first, letting the dog out. Here's a dog, so. <laughs> We've had the wandering cats before, but that's the first. She's been whining at me for the last about 15, 20 minutes, and I keep thinking, if I leave this long, I'm going to turn around, I'll find something on the floor. So I thought I'd better let her outside. <laughs> Good on you. Um, so just uh, going through to so the keratitis, microbial keratitis, um, that's that uh, picture we saw, we saw before on the, on the uh, left side here. That is um, uh, bacterial, fungal, acanthamoeba. The ones that, again, I, I want to know about this one is, um, have they wore contact lenses? Um, because these can give you really nasty um, corneal infection. Um, and the, probably the, the one that we really, really worry about is a canthamoeba, which is a parasitic sort of um, you find in water. Um, so if someone that comes in and says, do you wear contact, you know, the, with a red eye and you look at the eye and you see this nasty ulcer on the eye, um, 
do you wear contact lenses? Yes. Have you been showering in your contact lens or swimming? Particularly, have you been swimming in a, um, like a thermal pool or something like that, or a spa pool? Um, you want to rule out a camphamoeba because this is really quite a nasty condition. This can cause um, quite terrible disease of the cornea. Um, uh, and a canthamoeba, for some reason, for patients who wear contact lenses and they get this disease, have pain that seems to exceed um, uh, what you'd look at the eye. So that the, the corner loss, it doesn't look that bad, but they just an excruciating pain. And that's often a, a little red flag warning sign to think, is this a canthamoeba? And of course, any, any uh, ulcer, you want to swab and send them off. Um, and you want to put them onto broad, uh, broad uh, spectrum antibiotic, topical eye drops, until you get that culture back and then it, whatever it tells you is basically and hit it specifically with whatever anti, um, antibiotic or anti-fungal um, treatment. Um, fungal keratitis uh, is actually re also very nasty and I've, I've seen a few of these with, um, seem to be farmers unfortunately who, um, you know, out in, the, uh, out in the, um, the paddock or on the farm and they get a bit of muck into the eye from, you know, sheep or whatever and uh, or a scratch somehow and the f fungal infection is just nasty it really really sets in it can be very very hard to treat um, often it's mistaken to begin with for an uh, for a, a bacterial infection and you are treating them with antibacterials and the problem's not and is not bacterial it's fungal um, so again a good history uh, and anyone sort of in a rural area comes in where the corner loss so you kind of want to rule out a fungal infection as well um, as you said before herpes simplex that's the that's the picture there on the top right with this little uh, funny little like a little tree branch ulcer on the corner with a dendritic ulcer. So that's from the cold sore virus. So that's um, people with cold sores. Um, again, you want to get a good history. Do you get cold sores on your lips? Um, the you can get a cold sore into the eye, um, and um, they tend to do pretty well if you can catch them early. Um, antiviral treatment with a um, topical. Um, Zavirax, so acyclovir, um, or even systemic um, uh, antiviral uh, like acyclovir or valcyclovir, um, really important to get on top of that. And um, topical steroids are sometimes indicated if the uh, infection goes inside the eye. So you can sometimes get an inflammatory response from the cornea inside the eye, and you're going to need to put them on topical steroids. But this is you got to be very, very cautious because steroids uh, into a dendritic ulcer can actually make it a whole lot worse. So really that needs um, an ophthalmologist to make that decision and also to be able to have the equipment to make sure um, we're actually causing a further problem by starting them on steroids. Um, herpes zoster is the shingles virus, which um, is pretty damn nasty if it gets into the eye. I mean, shingles is not nice anyway. Um, and you often find it comes down sort of the ophthalmic nerve, the V1 distribution down the trigeminal nerve. Um, and if you get these sort of crusting lesions that come down the scalp into the um, up around the eyelid. And what we'll often find is somewhere around about one or two weeks after they get the, the blisters, that if they start developing a red eye with a decrease in vision, if you look at that, you'll find that unfortunately they've had an inflammatory reaction of the shingles into the eye. This is really hard to actually get on top of. This can take sometimes several years of treatment to actually get these people um, quiet. And sometimes, unfortunately, people never get rid of the shingles. Once it gets into the eye, it just doesn't want to let go. The inflammatory reaction from shingles is quite prolonged. Um, and it's topical steroids, plus or minus antihypertensive drops because the viral nature of shingles, and actually I should have said also with the herpes simplex, the cold sore virus, can give you a high pressure in the eye, secondary high pressure, um, which is equally another problem to try and deal with as well. And of course, topical steroids. I said um, a high pressure in the eye can be caused by steroids. Uh, so that can also be a causative problem. So sometimes these people on steroids and antihypertensive anti drops, sometimes for many years, um, which is, uh, you know, um, you, I see some patients I've seen three or four or five years, you know, every couple of months. They just we, Every time we think we've beaten it, the damn thing comes back again. So not a nice thing, shingles. Um, the last section is um, so inflammatory problems in the eye. So inflammatory red eye. So uveitis, episcleritis, scleritis. Uveitis is inflammation of the uvea layer. So that's the that's part of the, the choroid. The, and um, the uvea is the, the vascular layer, the middle part of the eye. Um, so the one on the left here, that's uh, a very typical sort of um, quite deep, what we call circumferential, 360 degree um, 
uh, injection of the eye. Um, and if you look inside the anterior chamber, so the front of the eye, you'll see these little white cells floating around. And this is what we call a uveitis or anterior uveitis. Um, the second picture here, that's an episcleritis, is what we call a sectorial injection. So it's redness, but it's just limited to one, one part of the eye. Um, and um, the bottom one down there is also, it, it, doesn't, it probably looks the least um, uh, serious out of all of them. It's just, a, you can see on the bottom there, the person's looking down. There's just a bit of redness, I don't know if I can get my mouse, just a bit of redness around this area. Um, and it's very vague, but what it's actually showing is you can actually see the blood vessels on top really clearly. The influence, the redness is very deep, uh, right into the sclera. And this is actually, this scleritis is, is the most worrying out of all of these um, because potentially it's a sign of some sort of systemic inflammatory condition that is, uh, um, it's, it's kind of showing itself in the eye. And this, this is potentially quite problematic. Um, the... Um, sort of uveitis, as I say, is intraocular inflammation. Patients will often, um, this is a sort of a really um, uh, clear, um, definitive sort of photophobic. The eye feels bruised. If they just touch it gently, it just feels it's got like a bruise. Pain is sort of mild to moderate. Um, but anything that someone's come and said, I've got a red eye with photophobia, my eye feels bruised, mild to moderate pain, you kind of think this is a uveitis. And if you look at the eye, you'll see these little white cells floating in, in the middle of the eye. Um, treatment for this is basically intensive topical steroids on a slow taper of up to six weeks. So someone with a uveitis, we want to hit it really hard and fast. So we want to put um, Predfort, um, Maxidex, those really strong steroid eye drops into the eye every half an hour or an hour uh, for about a week. So it's got a lot of drops into that eye um, and then slowly taper it down every time, you know, down and down and down over a period of six weeks. Um, we also put patients on uh, a midriatic, which is basically a dilator, uh, like cyclogel, to try and pretend, uh, prevent, I should say, this pupil synechiae. So if you get a lot of these little white cells floating around the inside of the eye, that can actually stick the pupil to the lens behind. And you get a basically a pupil that never dilates properly again. You get a funny shaped pupil. I'm not sure, actually, if I go back to that previous picture, if it's easy to see or not, the pupil round here looks nice and round. As you get up here, it suddenly drops down. This part here up here is actually stuck. So the pupil is actually stuck at the top part of the eye there. So that's why we put them on a, a midriatic, try and dilate before trying to break the you know, adhesions and keep them dilated um, up to you know two, three, four weeks um, to try and stop those adhesions happening. Uh, we often take bloods for this to try and work out if there's an underlying systemic condition. Um, episcleritis is probably the least, is most benign out of these things. It's just a superficial episcleral inflammation. So it's it's not the conjunctiva, which is the surface layer of the eye. It's not the sclera, which is the, the middle layer of the eye. It's in between those two. It's the epi, what we call the episcleral layers. And that's inflammation there. It's generally mild, minimal to mild pain, uh, self-limiting most times. Um, most of the time it's benign. Uh, it will often self-resolve by itself, but if people are having some problems, and sometimes um, a mild steroid like um, FML, a fluoromethylone, or even non-steroidal eye drops like um, Voltaren or Acular can be quite helpful. Occasionally you might put someone on systemic non-steroidals if they're having, if it just doesn't go away and they've been, you know, six, eight weeks of this. Um, obviously you just want to be careful um, with all the problems that you know, non-steroidals can actually um, give you. And the last one that we, I said before, the one that we really worry about, which is the scleritis. Um, th that's often, you'll know this because they describe pain that's really severe and it feels like a boring pain. Like someone's actually got a corkscrew, as some people say, and they're corkscrewing into the eye. It's a horrible pain. It'll wake, wake people up from sleep, whereas these two won't. Um, and it's often related to systemic disease. So we're thinking of things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, um, autoimmune diseases, um, uh, like um, lupus and that type of thing. We can see it often presents itself in the eye. Um, it can be very, very nasty, uh, these sclerotis. You can often get necrotizing sclerotis where basically the, the, the sclera just disintegrates and you, and you get a real massive thinning of the sclera. Um, the treatment for this is, is intensive topical steroids as well as systemic steroids. And often these people go on to immunomodulatory agents, so things like um, 
um, infliximabs, emethotrexates, all those pretty powerful um, sort of uh, um, treatments to try and just keep down, stop the immune system from kicking off there. Um, uh, so yeah, scleritis, the, the key one with that one is um, a red eye with, with quite severe pain. Um, and, and sectorial injection. So normally it's just um, in, uh, injection redness in one part of the eye, but it doesn't look that, that nasty. When you look at it, it's, um, people often say you get a, when you look at it, you get a, like a purple hue. The actual, it looks more purple than red, um, which is often a sign, you know, things are not actually good because that's signs of the sclera thinning, which is not a good sign. Um, and I think that's the end of my talk. You've done very well. Uh, we still do have a few more questions. You, have you got to rush off? No. no. Okay. Uh, how would you recognise a CRAO? Um, so you massive drop in vision. Um, so you, you'd have basically vision that would go to count fingers, hand movements, and, and very rapid. So no redness of the eye, and normally it's not painful. Someone would just say, my vision's gone like that. Um, and on, uh, if you had a look at the back of the eye, you often see uh, around that macula, so the central part of your eye, see like what we call a, a cherry red spot, which is basically a red, a red spot around the back of the eye. Um, if you did a scan, we've got a little special scanning machines, you'll find that there's just basically um, the artery, there's a lot of death of all the, um, the cellular layer. Um, you want these sent off for rapid bloods and potentially sent off to a stroke unit because basically what they've had is a stroke of the eye. Um, and if it's happened there, then potentially it could be happening elsewhere in the brain. So if we see these patients, uh, we, we pretty quickly get them to either an ED or to, or stroke team to, to kind of get on top of it. Um, depending on how long it's been there, it's, there's, you know, if it's been there for, I'd say, for a few hours, you're potentially going to have poor vision for forever. Um, it's not going to be fixable, unfortunately. Um, the other problem long term that we worry about with a central retinal artery occlusion or a central retinal vein occlusion is you can get secondary ischemia of the eye because the eye has obviously lost its blood supply and then you can get basically um, a neovascularization so blood vessels trying to grow all through the middle of the eye to try and get on top of the area of ischemia and that causes can cause a secondary glaucoma really high gl horrible glaucoma that you can't fix and potentially you've got a blind painful eye that sometimes you have to remove completely to actually give the patient relief which is not a nice situation all right. Uh, chronic eye disease with mucus discharge, what would you recommend? Um, chronic dry eye, sorry, with mucus discharge. Yeah, so, I mean, dry eye is, is quite, uh, can be quite problematic. Um, when, when people say mucus discharge, uh, it's, it's hard to say without actually seeing it, but I mean, a dry eye, um, because the, the tear film's disrupted, you get quite a, um, and often quite a gluggy tear film, um, which you can get quite a, you know, a bit of um, crusting. And so in the first instance, I'd try, you know, that heat and massage is really, really important. Um, the one thing I'd say about mucus discharge that we find for some patients is if they get a lot of mucus and they tend to, it's always in the bottom, they tend to try and pull it out and it kind of reappears. That often is actually the causative factor is, is constantly pulling at the stuff. Um, it causes basically a nasty little cycle of of, build, uh, of pulling it away and it re and it regrows and pulling it away and regrows. So we call that mucus fishing, uh, where people are uh, they get this sort of a lot of mucus and they keep pulling it out of the eye and it comes back, come back. And the, the treatment that is to stop stop pulling out the mucus, just leave it there, let it do its thing. But dry eye disease in terms of of crusting, that the best thing to do is probably heat a massage. Um, lubricating drops can stabilize the tear film in the short term. Um, so um, in New Zealand, poly tears is, is, is one of the few drops that we have funded, um, which is, a, is an okay drop. It's, it's not the best drop out there it's because it does have um, a preservative called benzalkonium chloride, which can be quite nasty on the eye, particularly if you're using it more than four or six times a day. Um, so if someone's using drops that often, you'll often find that their eye drops are starting now cause a problem. They're, they're, we're not fixing the problem anymore. The eye drops are making a problem. Um, and if you, I would say if you're using lubricating drops, you know, six, eight, 10 times a day, you really need to be thinking about using preservative free eye drops uh, that don't have a preservative, but unfortunately they're not funded um, in New Zealand. Well, you can actually get a funded thing called Hilo Fresh, but you have to prove to Pharmac again that uh, polytes is not working or, uh, you know, um, 
Hyla Fresh is a really good eye drop, but it's quite expensive um, and can be quite hard to get people onto that. Yeah. Very good. And one more, and then we'll call it a day. How do you clinically tell the difference between a bad conjunctivitis and keratitis? And what was that? Keratitis. Keratitis. So um, so again, it would it probably uh, vision and and um, pain. So in uh, I, look, I have to say, you're right, a bad conjunctivitis can give you a drop in vision. Um, a keratitis will definitely give you a drop in vision and quite a significant drop in vision. Um, and I, with a quite a nasty keratitis, you probably won't get a big uh, won't improve with pinhole. Whereas a conjunctivitis, you should get some sort of improvement with pinhole. Um, Keratitis won't normally give you uh, um, uh, a, a bad discharge. It would just be quite watery. Um, whereas conjunctivitis often you can tell just because it's quite uh, mucousy or, or purulent discharge. Um, but of course, the mainstay of trying to work out is um, either a slit lamp exam because that will give you a definitive di uh, diagnosis. If you don't have one of those, stain the eye, get some fluorescein and stain the eye. And if you see like a little white spot or a bit of staining right in the middle, um, then potentially, you know, you know that's probably a keratitis as opposed to a conjunctivitis, um, and yeah, that, the, the, probably the you know the gold standard is to get get someone onto a slit lamp, which is the microscope, and have a look and see what's going on there. Thank you so much, David. That's been really, really informative. I've had lots of um, lovely messages thanking you. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'd like to thank you as well, and, and um, thank everybody who's participated. The, a lot of people hung on there till the end. Thank you very much. For <laughs> um, um, I think it was really worth doing. Thank you. And I'll, I'll end the meeting now. Thank you.